Today is National Coming Out Day. Um, October 11th, on October 11th, 1987, that was the anniversary of the second National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. In, a year later, in 1988, National Coming Out Day was established on the March's anniversary to celebrate coming out and raising awareness of the LGBTQ community and its own civil rights movement. Today, for those who are able, we say stand up, stand out, and be proud. To that end, we are thrilled to have CJ Janaby here today as our distinguished guest. CJ is a veteran journalist based here in Kansas City, Missouri. She's the managing editor for online news and future stories at KCUR, Kansas City's NPR affiliate, where she's also been an arts and um, culture reporter. Her book, No Place Like Home, Lessons in Activism from LGBT Kansas, won the 2019 um, Stubbendike Great Plains Distinguished Book Prize, was named a Kansas Notable Book for 2019, and was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award in LGBTQ nonfiction. Before joining KCUR, CJ spent four years right here on campus as Director of Communications, leading publicity and strategic communication efforts for all three schools, and serving on the Executive Vice Chancellor's leadership team. Prior to that, she spent 10 years as editor of The Pitch, Kansas City's Village Voice media-owned alt weekly newspaper, where CJ and her writers won numerous national and local journalism awards. CJ grew up in Nebraska, graduated from the University of California at Berkeley, and then all the way across the country got her master's in creative writing from BU. She and her wife have two dogs. Today's presentation is titled Accidental Leadership in LGBT Kansas. Please join me in giving a warm KUMC welcome to CJ Janaby. Ryan, thank you for that, um, that nice introduction, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it's so great to be here in this room where uh, some folks were saying earlier that it's uh, the long, skinny room, so it's hard to give a talk in here. But when I worked here, I came to lots of um, I came to hear lots of really important people give talks here, and so it, it's a, it's a huge honor to be to be here today and um, to be invited back. It feels like a homecoming. I see um, lots of familiar faces in addition to lots of people I don't know. So thanks, thank you again for coming and thanks to whoever's watching remotely. I don't know quite what you're seeing, but hello. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I had, I had such a, such a um, rich four years here. Um, it, it was in some ways, sort of a detour from my true profession of journalism. And I came here knowing some things about, about uh, rural health in particular, but I knew nothing about really science or uh, many of the, it, pretty much everything else that you do. And I just learned a phenomenal amount and I made, uh, I made lifelong friends and um, being here today, it feels, well, I just live two blocks away, so I never really left. Um, I've seen every, all the changes on the campus sort of on a day-to-day -day basis uh, since I left. So anyway, thank you. It feels fabulous to be here. Um, what I'm going to do today, just, um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about how this book happened, why it happened. Um, I'm going to read a few sections and then uh, and then we can have a conversation. So this um, this is the leadership series and the um, the people that I write about. I, I've titled this accidental leadership because most of the people that I write about, a few of them you would maybe see their names in headlines, but most of these people were not public figures. They weren't uh, generally elected officials. They were basically people in their communities who saw something that needed to be done and so they just did it. And um, I, I, as I was sort of working on it, I came to think of these folks as not even grassroots activists or activists who were so far in the grassroots that they were working in the dirt. And um, for a lot of them, that's how it felt doing this particular, doing activism around LGBTQ stuff in Kansas was could get dirty at times. So, 
So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm there. We go. Uh, so, uh, in case in case Ryan didn't uh, explain why we we're talking about coming out on this particular day, here's uh, here's that National March on Washington in in '87. This was not my best mullet of the '80s, <laughs> but it's kind of up there in the in the in the better ones that I had, and I was there. So I'm speaking from quite a bit of experience uh, here today. Um, who knows much, just raise your hand if you know much about that 87 March on Washington or anything. Okay, so like four hand, five hands maybe. So just real quick, not to belabor this, but um, this was 87, this was several years into the AIDS crisis in the United States of America. Our, our president at the time and his administration had done virtually nothing to address this huge public health crisis. And uh, people were dying, thousands and tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of people died. Uh, there, were, there were fights going on at the National Institutes of Health about how to, there were, there were a lot of uh, power struggles and infighting among the science uh, community about all this. If you if you end up having any interest in this, Randy Schultz's and the band played on is a great primer for what was going on in your community, really, in those days. So we were angry. Uh, Cleve Jones had the idea to make the, the Names Project Memorial Quilt, and so that was the first display of that. It um, stretched all all along the National Mall took up that whole green space that, uh, that you know, between the, uh, the two memorials. And it was so heartbreaking. I mean, you can sort of see how many people were there just wandering around and it was completely quiet, except you could sort of hear people crying or some whispers about, about some of the sentiments that were expressed on those quilts. Anyone seen panels of the AIDS quilt? Yeah, so you just, some of you know what, what they look like on an individual level. And uh, so there was like three days of activism in DC besides this giant march, which we knew there were easily half a million people there and the press reported it as 200,000. And so we began to understand even just how the media reports uh, things that are happening in our world. You know, there, there was just sort of, um, everything was political. And uh, so we laid out the quilt, we marched, we had a huge demonstration at the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court had just decided that it was perfectly okay for two gay guys to be arrested in their bedroom in Georgia for having consensual sex. Uh, that law has since changed, but that was what was happening in, that had happened in 1986. You could be arrested for having sex in your bedroom with your boyfriend uh, consensually. Supreme Court said that was okay. Um, we, and a lot of people, hundreds of people met, met with their elected representatives that weekend. And so out of that weekend came, I think, uh, several, you know, more decades of organization and activism since then. So there's your October 11th, uh, off the cuff mini lecture. Um, what's my next slide here? So people may remember this image. Right, this gets us more into contemporary times. June 15th, uh, sorry, June 2015, um, Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage. Um, by the time this happens, um, according to polls, mo the, the slight majority of Americans are fine with gay people getting married. This to me was, and to a lot of folks who are watching, <laughs> the result of a um, really astounding change in public opinion over 10 years. And this is kind of where my book comes in. So here are some of the people in the book. This is a group of Kansans in April 2005, looking at election results from the night that Kansas passes a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Almost 10 years, actually 10 years exactly before this decision by the US Supreme Court. So 70% of Kansans 10 years earlier banned gay marriage. Does anyone remember that? 
Okay, so I remember that. And if you weren't really sort of in, the super involved in that, I will tell you that having 70% of your friends, neighbors, coworkers, family members, 70% of your community going into the church basement or the community center or wherever and voting against you, that hurts. Okay. And you can see that hurt on the faces of, of some of these folks, of all these folks that are watching the election results come in. So the woman in the, so I write, I write about several of these people in the, in the course of the book. What basically what happened is I wanted to, I, I, I saw that, that attitudes were changing. I saw that some things have been going on in Kansas, which we'll talk about in a second. And I thought this is a, such a, so, so the, I had, had this idea for this book in about 2013. I was still working here. And there were a couple of other decisions by the Supreme Court that made it clear that marriage equality was going to happen. It just wasn't, this, it wasn't um, consistent across the country. It was legal in some states, not in other states. And I thought this is a really weird moment in American legal, cultural, political landscape. And it needs to be investigated and Kansas is the perfect place to, to study this phenomenon. Why? Because people all over the world have opinions about Kansas. They think they know Kansas because of a stupid movie that came out in 1939. <laughs> Kansas also, unlike all the surrounding states in the Midwest that have very, very similar political dynamics and also had that same election results, banning gay marriage 70%, same, same percentage in Missouri, Nebraska. Nebraska was 80%, I think, a few years earlier. What makes Can and what's another thing that makes Kansas different? Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah. Um, which I like to think of. I, I mean, I, it could be debatable what's Kansas's um, bigger international export, wheat, or the Westboro Baptist Church. <laughs> um, Plus, Kansas is just in the middle of the country, so it's a, it's a just great sort of place to zoom in and focus on on a, a cultural phenomenon like this one. So I started, so I, I just sort of started talking to people. I started driving around. This is, um, I, did, I did not do any of this on KUMC time. I did this on <laughs> weekends. Um, but these are the main, a lot of the main cities that I hit. So I went out to went way out west. I spent time in Salina, Hutchinson, Manhattan, and I, and I sort of, the book is organized by, by chronologically, but also by place. So I really got to know a lot of people in these different, different uh, towns. Um, here's a woman named Sandra Stenzel who lives way out in Trigo County. And um, so the first part of the book is sort of just a sense of defeat. Sandra was among those people who was trying to stop that marriage amendment from passing in 05 and she ended up losing her job and uh, her life was really ruined by the fact that she testified publicly against that amendment uh, in 2005. Um, she's a, she, her family is a third generation farm family out near Waukini and uh, this is really sad. So from there, Though, um, what happened, what I, what I knew was happening is that Hutchinson and Salina were trying to pass non-discrimination ordinances and that, and these, um, these were very dramatic periods in the lives of these towns. And um, uh, so, this, so I was reading about it in the Kansas City Star. This is this story, and uh, and I was and the the opponents of these non discrimination ordinances was a religious organization uh, called Awaken Kansas. It's now called the I think the Kansas Family Alliance, Policy Alliance or something like that. But um, so so what would happen in all these towns would be the uh, LGBT people and their allies would go to City Hall, and this is much like is happening in Johnson County right now, which I'll talk about in a second. They'd go to City Hall and say. You have a list of, the, of, of people who can't be discriminated against. You can't be discriminated against on the basis of gender, age, marital status, religion, country of origin. Every municipality and institution has these, these lists. 
So the people go to City Hall and they say, please add sexual orientation and gender identity. And everybody freaks out. And there's like months of testimony, there's newspaper stories, there's sometimes there's petition drives, and it becomes this big controversy in these towns. And ultimately what, what happens in all these towns is the ordinance gets um, either, either passes and then it gets repealed or it doesn't pass at all. And it, it's this, this more of this sort of painful process. But in the, in the process, people told me, um, the people who were pushing this, even though they lost at the ballot box, they made all these friends and allies and all of these supporters came out and, and um, a whole community was created where there wasn't one before. These people found each other and all the newspaper stories and the testimony all educated the whole town. And so you might not win at the ballot box, but you, you end up creating this other beautiful thing. So like in Salina, um, but one of the guys said to me, you know, we did, if, if this wouldn't have happened, this law would be on the books and we wouldn't have had all these, we wouldn't have met all these friends and supporters and, and everything would just be the way it always was. But now there's this community and, and they plan to have their first pride ever in Salina and they, they anticipated 200 people and 500 people showed up. And so this guy's like, you know, it's the best time to be gay in Salina, <laughs> even if they don't have legal protections. <laughs> So that's one of the things I write about. So here we are, and um, I just want to sort of emphasize this, that the, this whole, the whole middle of the book is really about talking about Salina and Hutchinson. Manhattan eventually passes their non-discrimination ordinance in 2016. Lawrence being the blue dot passed it. They had passed one that included sexual orientation back in the 90s. They added gender identity in, the, um, in 2011. Poland Park, that was another one of the big, uh, con that was a big controversy here in 2014. And then look at all this, you know, almost your whole county, not your whole county, the neighboring county, uh, has passed these ordinances in the last year, which is, I don't even know what to quite think of. Actually, I do know what I think about it, but um, everybody's, has, have you guys, who's been watching this happen? Quite a few of you, so. Sorry? Westwood. I just added this Westwood this morning when I saw that. So, so it turns out that the stuff I wrote about is actually still happening. It's, it, it turns out to be very timely. Total coincidence. Um, okay, so here's the part. So I'm just going to read you like four passages. And they're, they're really sort of from the, from the sad beginnings through the, through the middle and then toward the end. And, um, uh, so this will give you sort of a sense of what the, what people's lives were like, what people told me and what the book kind of, kind of feels like. So again, it's, it's each chapter is set in a different place, a different city. And then usually it centers on one or two or three main characters or human beings, characters. Human beings. Um, so, um, so this is a woman named Tiffany Muller. Uh, she's the one in the peach blazer, uh, right in the middle of this picture. So this is Tiffany and Tiffany is 26 at the time of the action in this book. Really? She's a, she's going to school at Washburn. She's pretty, you know, sort of hardwired to be active and energetic and, um, uh, she decides to, to try for one of these non-discrimination ordinances in Topeka. And then, what, and then what happens is someone on the city council leaves and there's an open seat and she gets appointed to that seat. And Topeka's like, oh my God, there's a lesbian on the city council. <laughs> and her council actually, the, the Westboro compound is in her district. So it's getting, all, it's getting all crazy for her. And then she goes to work to try and stop the marriage amendment from passing. And she decides she should run for the seat that she's been appointed to. And as it turns out, um, one, of the, one of her opponents in that race is Fred Phelps' granddaughter. And all of this stuff sort of collides in April of 2005. So what happens is her election for city council, the non-discrimination ordinance, and this, the marriage amendment statewide, these are all on the ballot in this little section that I'm going to read about here. And so the New York Times comes in 
because you know it's Kansas and it's the Phelpses, and so they and this all this stuff is churning in Topeka. So I'll pick up with the New York Times. This is a photo of, that ran of her, the photo of her that ran in the Times, and I'll pick up uh, with their reporting, and then I'll get into mine. And I I would like to say an f bomb if that's okay, because it's the person's experience. Um, so I'm gonna just say it because you're adults, and um, and just so just a warning. So, so, uh, so this is the New York Times. The race has become as much as anything a debate over Mr. Phelps, whose incessant daily pickets and hate-filled faxes have plagued Topeka for 14 years, yet whose opposition to the anti-discrimination ordinance is shared by many residents of this church-laden, Republican-leaning city of 125,000. The Phelps' tactics have turned some evangelical ministers and conservative businessmen into un unlikely crusaders for gay rights, backing measures like the anti-discrimination ordinance, if only as an antidote to the Phelps family's message. And with an amendment to the state constitution to ban same-sex marriage on the ballot in April, many other religious and civic leaders are trying mightily to stop the Phelpses from hijacking what they see as a signature issue. So that's the Times report. Tiffany Muller's father, who was on the city council in his small town of Cleveland, Missouri, brought her stepmother and joined Muller for a day of door-to-door -door campaigning. Because father and daughter had city council service in, in common, Muller said, he thought it would be so neat. But he was canvassing in a town where citizens had spent decades steeping in the Phelps' toxins. People would yell at him and scream at him, She's going to hell. How could you raise her to be like that? Get the hell off my porch. You're going to hell. Other times people would say, come in, you're our hero. We baked you lemon bars. One night a neighbor who had asked Muller for a yard sign several weeks earlier showed up at her house. She had a bloody lip and her face was messed up. You could tell she was going to have a black eye. I was like, oh my God, come in, what happened? The woman told Muller she had left her house to go to the store and some people nearby said, why do you have that fucking dyke sign in your yard? Are you a dyke? The woman said, yeah, so what? Muller had no idea her neighbor was gay. And they followed her to a store and they beat her up in the parking lot. Horrified, Muller was preparing to call the police and take her neighbor to the hospital. But that wasn't why the woman had knocked on her door. She says, no, 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 don't call the police. They stole my yard sign and I want another yard sign. <laughs> That's, that's, that's the early part of the book. Toward the middle, one of the things that happens is after the loss of the marriage amendment, uh, a lot of activists decide they don't ever want to be put in the position of being sort of sideswiped. They want to be organized, so they sort of start chapters of what's known as now known as Equality Kansas. Anyone heard of that? So um, statewide. Chapters in different cities, the, there's a separate group in Manhattan called the um, Clinton Hills Human Rights Project. One of the, one of the folks, so they organized out in Western Kansas. Uh, they had a chapter around Dodge City and one of the people involved in that chapter is named Tanya Jantz. And uh, for the folks out there, um, there's a little bit of, of tension between the folks in the, in the bigger cities because the chapters in the bigger cities wanted to be more political and you know sort of take political action the folks out west just wanted to meet other other gay people and so they were a little more social in their uh, get-togethers but anyway Tanya is one of the folks who's who's uh, who gets involved in this effort out, out there and uh, read you a little bit about Tanya she had known she was different from age seven or eight, but in the 70s in Western Kansas, there were no words to describe it. Jantz dated men after heading to Southwestern College, a tiny Methodist school in Winfield, south of Wichita, on a tennis scholarship. She kept discovering that more of the girls on her teams were lesbians. Her dorm was filled with them. They invited her to their parties, which made her uncomfortable until she finally came out herself fake IDing her way into fantasy in Wichita in the mid 80s. It was awesome, she said at the bar. You had the country music side and the rock side and the outside part with the volleyball nets. <clears throat> it was just 200 gay people every Friday and Saturday night. All the basketball players from Bethany, Bethel and Southwestern 
these were the Evangelical Lutheran Mennonite and Methodist affiliated colleges in Lindsborg, Newton, and Winfield that competed against each other on Saturday nights, but on Friday nights, we'd be out there and hook up and talk and communicate in our little secret language, secret world. Chance moved to Kansas City for chiropractic school, and as her graduation drew near in the early 90s, she planned on establishing a practice in Denver. I thought, I need to go someplace and be gay, really, and not have to hide myself. But the chiropractor in Cimarron, Dr. Ellis, was ill with emphysema and cancer. Jance had to do an inter internship anyway, so she figured she would spend a few weeks studying with him and visiting her family. People begged her to stay. This is not someplace I want to live at all, Jance thought. Unlike Denver, Cimarron was home to only about 2,000 people. She liked mountains, but Cimarron was high plains flat. She liked to ride jet skis, but Cimarron was about an hour and a half from the nearest decent lake. She didn't like the heat, didn't like the constant wind or the omnipresent stench of feed yards. People would say, that's the smell of money, Tanya. Well, it's not my money. It's like, geez, it stinks out here. <laughs> but the people were irresistible. People in Southwest Kansas, they're just very endearing, very loving, very giving. Sometimes for Jance, the smell of money was fresh bread or a casserole. A Mennonite lady might come in with six kids and say, I need them worked on and I can't afford it. Okay, sure, I'll take cookies and whatever you got. So I did a lot of free care. I still do a lot of free care. When Jan says still, she's talking about more than 20 years. Jan buckled down, healing the aches and pains of Cimarron and spending time with her grandparents. Fearing she would lose her family if they found out she was gay, she hid that part of herself, or thought she did. One day, she went to pick up her 76-year-old grandfather who was being released from the hospital in Dodge. Listening to music on the drive home, he asked if she had any Melissa Etheridge. <laughs> I was like, really? He goes, yeah, your Aunt Liz Linda listens to that Come to My Window song all the time. Do you have that? <laughs> of course, Jens did. <laughs> So I popped in the CD and we're listening to it. And he goes, you know, she's from Leavenworth, right? She's from Kansas. I said, well, yes, Grandpa, I do. He says, do you know she's a lesbian? I about choked and wrecked the truck. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. And he goes, well, you know, that's just all right. And that was all that was said. It was all that needed to be said. Jance stayed with him every night for the next month, helping her grandmother take care of him until he died at home. So what we begin to learn is that Kansas attitudes aren't all what the sort of stereotype is about Kansas. So here are a couple other women. Um, Darcy Potroff and Jolene Spain live in Manhattan. And um, they, this next little section I'll read you happens at, at around 2014 after those Supreme Court decisions make it obvious that marriage equality is going to happen. Sam Brownback's administration is fighting as hard as it possibly can, like resisting every, uh, every inch of territory, telling county judges that they can make decisions on whether or not to issue marriage licenses and all sorts of, of other uh, sort of, um, st I don't want to say stonewalling, um, resistance. So, uh, so this picks up right, right around that time, okay? So uh, far away from Brownback's cold-hearted office, the people of Kansas were starting to show that he didn't represent all of them. In Manhattan, something unusual began happening after Potroff and Spain's wedding ceremony on the sidewalk outside the Riley County Courthouse the previous November had put them at the center of a small market media frenzy involving the Manhattan Mercury, the KSNT TV broadcast from Topeka, and some AM radio news stations. The two women hadn't been particularly aggressive activists. We don't have rainbow flags hanging all over everything. I'm not out there going, gay rights for everybody, Potrov said. The biggest thing we do, most importantly, we're at home. We do some really strange things like have picnics in the backyard. We mow our lawn, we keep a nice house, trim the shrubbery out front, maintain our vehicles, maintain our home. We have kids and now five grandsons. We make a statement by being normal. Getting married in front of the media was the most newsworthy thing either one of them had ever done, 
Although Potraff had managed to get appointed to a seat on the city council of Riley, population just under a thousand. One day in the grocery store, a woman approached them. I do not know this lady, Spain remembered. She saw us, she looked, she went a little bit away, looked again, turned around and came back. She put her hand on my arm and said, are you the couple that got married? I said, yeah, we are. She said, can I give you a hug? She started bawling, just sobbing on Darcy's shoulder. She was like, I'm so happy for you. Wedding cards and presents started pouring in, which wasn't surprising because the couple had a wide circle of friends. But then envelopes started arriving in their mailbox with no return address. Wedding cards signed simply Dave and Martha or other names they didn't know. No last names. Quiet but solid, classically Kansan gestures of support. Okay, one more. I don't know how we're doing on time. Looks like we're okay. Um, so one more. Someone's name is Stephanie Mott, who I believe might have had presentations here at one point. Does anyone know Stephanie? Okay. Stephanie was a um, transgender activist who died uh, suddenly and unexpectedly of a heart attack this past March. And so I've begun reading the, the uh, section about her in my talks. Um, the last, so I said that, that the book is or, organized chronologically and by place. The last two chapters are profiles of trans activists in Kansas. So I, I, sort of, I sort of stopped talking about place and I start talking about the future. Um, and there were, there were there were two very visible and active trans women uh, in Kansas around, around the same period of time. Sandra Mead was one and Stephanie Mott was another one. And Stephanie has this amazing story. She grew up um, uh, in, on a farm outside of Lawrence and um, struggled her, most of her adult life to conform to societal expectations of being a man she called it something that felt like getting up every day and putting on her Steven suit. Um, this became, uh, this was not, this did not work and it did not work in sort of a dramatic, fairly dramatic way. She was an alcoholic, drug addict, sort of on this downward spiral, spiral found herself homeless uh, and ended up in the Topeka rescue mission where she ended up having a, a sort of classically Christian born again experience. She went to the chapel to get away from the other guys in the rescue mission and one day in the chapel, whoever was leading the service asked anyone if they would like to be, be, be you know, whatever they say. And, and uh, Stephanie thought, well, I've tried everything else, nothing else has worked. So yes, I will, I will do this. And she immediately, like the, to the, to the extent that any human being can literally be born again, this is what happened for her. And she began to embrace her authenticity with a sort of almost religious fervor. And she, she, she began writing columns in the monthly gay uh, liberty press that was distributed all around the, the state. She began giving public presentations. She started uh, something called the Kansas Statewide Transgender Education Project. And she gave hundreds of talks all around the state to anyone who would ask her to give a talk, she would go. So like, you know, college classes or HR departments or um, she would meet with law enforcement. This is uh, a day that I went with her to give a, a brown bag in June at a USDA lab in Manhattan. It was their sort of June diversity speaker uh, brown bag. And so she went to talk to the, the uh, NBAF scientists. If you can see the bumper stickers on her car, she's driving around with uh, this one, especially in the middle, transgender and Christian. So she drove all over the state in this car with these bumper stickers, giving these talks. And um, one, she, she in particular, the week, week, the long weekend of 4th of July in 2011, she decides, that, that um, you know, she's so tired of the rhetoric that she's hearing coming out of the state, state house in Topeka. She's gonna 
do something that she calls the transgender tour of Kansas. And so she drives a whole circle around the state and stops in tiny little towns in public places like restaurant parking lots and, and uh, those kinds of, you know, sort of safe out in the open spaces. And, and she stops people at random and says, I'm a writer. I'm talking to people. Can I just ask you a couple questions? Can I ask you what you know about transgender? And um, that would begin a lot of conversations. And she found that most people, the responses were one of two things in general. One, people usually said to each their own. And the other thing people said was, isn't that like gay? And she realized that people needed education. So that's when she started her education project. Um, and uh, and, she, and she wrote about this, this trip around the state. And, and she also encountered a lot of people who actually knew someone who was trans. And all of this was surprising. You think about this is 2011, and you think about the Vanity Fair cover with Caitlyn Jenner. That was 2014, so three years before this is sort of, you know, an emerging national conversation. Stephanie Mott's out driving around Kansas talking about it. So, in a uh, few few years later. Stephanie decides she's going to do this again, only it's going to be the transgender faith tour, and she's going to visit churches all around the Midwest. And so this passage that I'm going to read for you is the last of the, the final chapter. There's an epilogue then, but this is sort of how the book ends before the epilogue. And uh, it's after a whole profile of Stephanie where I've sort of told this whole story. So she's, uh, she's going to go on her transgender faith tour to places like Tulsa, Little Rock, Columbus, Ohio, those kind of places. And her home state. On July 12th, Mott visited the adult Sunday school class at Peace United Church of Christ in the tiny Flint Hills town of Alma, about 30 miles south of Manhattan. She'd been there before, she wrote on Facebook. It must have been in the early 1980s when my brother Dan was the pastor there. Dan and I both struggled with alcohol and demons unknown to ourselves and to each other. He lost his battle, indirectly related to alcohol, in 2000, and he never got to meet his sister, Stephanie. 20 years earlier, Mott wrote, Dan had, come to work, Dan, Dan had some work to do at the church, and she tagged along and played the piano while she waited for him. Now, she anticipated an emotional return. This is what she's writing on Facebook. So, I believe that Dan will be in attendance that day in whatever way might be possible. I believe that he will be very proud of his sister, Stephanie. Mott said the response from the 15 or 16 people who showed up for Sunday school that day was entirely positive, and some of them remembered Dan. One talked with me about how he had been there for her and her family at a time when they were losing a family member, how much that meant to her, Mott said. Walked out of that place knowing his love for me was enhanced by my authenticity. If Mott is effortlessly certain about the feelings of those now living in the great beyond, there are things about this world she still can't get her head around. When I first started doing this, I would speak to a college class and nobody in the class would know anybody who was transgender, she said. Today, a third or a half of the class knows somebody it's amazing to me that it's changed that much in that amount of time. It's not that there are more transgender people in the world now, it's that they're more free. After all, as Mott points out, given the vast diversity of creation, with so many beautiful variations in all living organisms, it makes no logical sense that humans would have only two narrowly defined genders. Another thing that always amazes Mott I'm going to stop here and, and uh, explain where I forgot to say in the beginning. She lives in Topeka now, right across from um, uh, Monroe Elementary School, which is the site of the Brown v. Board of Education uh, lawsuit. And um, okay, so I'll put it back up. Another thing that always amazes Mott, something she feels in her travels around the state. She might have grown up on a farm outside of Lawrence, but it was Topeka where she found salvation. She lives in a small house across the street from the old Monroe Elementary School where she used to vote in 2008. It was where she first voted as Stephanie. I hadn't legally changed my name yet, but I was presenting as Stephanie. The lady handing out ballots was like, how can you be Stephen? I explained that I was transgender. She got a confused look on her face, but this other lady where you pick up your ballot was just smiling. I had to publicly explain what transgender was. 
Then, in the home of Brown v. Board of Education, she voted for the man who would become the first black president. These days, the rest of the world might know the capital city of Kansas as the home of the Westboro Baptist Church and a scary legislature, but that's not all it is. Heading back into Topeka on evenings after trips west, as her Hyundai tops the hill just outside of town on Interstate 70, Mott always catches her breath at the sight of the city's lights. Wow, she thinks, this is my home. So Stephanie Mott, her uh, absence uh, ha has been a big blow to LGBTQ activism in Kansas. So uh, there's a need for folks to get involved. Um, that is, um, that's all I'm going to read. And um, we can, we can talk about any of this if anyone has questions, or you guys can just go do whatever you want. To do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much.